Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Richard Hara, and this is Social Impact Live, a weekly conversation with members of the Columbia School of Social Work community. And I'm pleased to welcome to our program today, Jennifer Borderman, um, who is a commander um, in the United States Public Health Service and also working, um, from what I understand, as a senior program management officer with the CDC. So um, we're going to have a little bit of a disclaimer in just a moment, but um, just wanted to say uh, welcome to Jennifer to our program. Thank you, um, Richard. Thanks to you and thanks to everyone who has joined the call. Um, yes, I do have a disclaimer in that um, anything I share today is um, from me, Jen, um, a proud alum, alumna of the Columbia University School of Social Work um, and not representative of the United States Public Health Service or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, although I'm a proud member of both, um, I just want to be clear that anything I share today is is um, based on on my thoughts and, and yeah. well yeah on your thoughts and your experience and mm -hmm. and you know I'd love to hear how it was that you got into this I guess somewhat non traditional role right as a social worker working for the government in the public health service and so on was this something that you envisioned when you were at the school of social work or did this just kind of you know happen along the way uh, thank you for asking that, Richard. It gives me an opportunity, opportunity to talk about um, one of the greatest heroes of my life, the greatest hero of my life, and that's my dad. And my dad is a retired admiral in the public health service, so I actually grew up as a PHS brat, if you will. Um, so I always knew it was out there, um, and I should mention that my dad um, um, is also a social worker. Mm, okay. And so I knew it was out there. I knew it was an opportunity for me but it just, um, because of various, you know, places in my life, it, it wasn't an option. Uh, but then, um, you know, towards the end of um, um, the early 2000s, uh, I had been thinking long and hard about wanting to serve and serve my country in uniform. And so I, went ahead and applied and it, it is a process to get in. It's very selective. Um, so it took me a little while, but I was able to be commissioned. Uh, and actually upon commissioning, I was assigned to the Department of Defense uh, where I worked at the Center for the Study of Traumatic Stress with some of the most oh. uh, researchers in suicide prevention and military, um, military uh, mental health. And uh, it was a tremendous opportunity to work alongside um, some of my strongest mentors. Uh, and, and then I went from there to SAMHSA, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services mm -hmm. Administration in uh, Rockville, and Maryland. And I was able to continue on in suicide prevention. And then I moved on to CDC uh, about three, a little over three years ago. Um, we're encouraged to move locations and move within agencies because um, I've had great experiences at all three. I wasn't looking to leave any of them uh, when I did, but um, but I will tell you the core has, I, I don't know the exact number, but I think it's somewhat around 200 social workers um, in, within our midst and they do everything from direct clinical care uh, to uh, leadership roles, um, uh, project management uh, runs the gamut. As we know, we have a very flexible and dynamic profession that we're a part of, and those are reflected in our roles within the core as well. Okay, well, um, I guess I'll, I'll be asking you about your role specifically and what sort of role we as social workers can play um, in, in an agency like yours. Um, before I do so, though, uh, I want to remind our viewers that we always reserve the last 10 minutes of the show for Q&A. So if you've got a question for Jennifer, please write it into our chat box and uh, it'll be passed along to us by the program manager. So hopefully we can read them out and address them for the last 10 minutes of the show. So 
Q and A reminder. Okay, um, Jennifer. So uh, again, what what is um, the social work role within the public health service? And I know that um, you also have a, a title as a resilience chief. Is 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 that correct? Or what, what, sure. what is that? Sure. Uh, well, I'm I'm very proud of um, my colleagues at CDC and the leadership there who uh, determined that. We need to focus on staff resiliency. Um, you know, <laughs> you've heard CDC a lot in the news lately, but we are constantly fighting battles around the world. Mm. And our staff, they're just some of the most amazing human beings who truly care. They are the best and the brightest, and they are on the front lines, whether it be Ebola, measles, uh, certainly COVID-19, polio, you name it, and they are on the front lines um, working in these areas. And because of that, uh, obviously, um, mental health uh, is, is an important piece and, um, and, and resilience and embracing that, uh, that message of we work really hard um, but there's, um, there's a reason we do, and we can all become stronger through our work and through our support of each other and grow um, on the other side. And so I have a team, uh, a small uh, but mighty team, as I like to say, mm -hmm. and we work on resilience issues um, across responses primarily. Uh, right now at the CDC, we're involved in polio, Ebola uh, in DRC, um, and obviously COVID-19 is taking up a great deal of time. Mm. So, excuse me, um, we are, uh, you know, I'm the only social worker on the team. Mm. Uh, so I think what I add to it is that advocacy piece that I think those of us certainly who attended Columbia uh, hold near and dear to our hearts is such a big, important part of what we do. Um, and so it's making sure that our, um, our staff are being heard um, if there are concerns and how we can help navigate systems to improve um, the environment within which we work. Okay, so um, if you could uh, give me a, a concrete example of something that you and your team have been working on in the past couple weeks or something, a particular project or issue or what does that look like? Well, we've been working on a lot of things. Um, in fact, tomorrow will be my first day off since February, <laughs> so I'm very much looking forward to that. Mm. Um, not that uh, my leadership hasn't been very encouraging of me taking time off, to be clear, but um, those of us uh, um, and anyone who happens to know me who's watching know that I don't, um, I don't uh, back off easily. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, we, we've had um, deployers at the quarantine stations at various airports, uh, mm. you know, our, our larger international airports, and we've had folks there under really tough conditions um, and ever-changing conditions. So we've been spending time, spending time on um, Skype calls and presentations with them encouraging resilience. We've um, been working with our folks within the Emergency Operations Center where that one picture um, shows uh, my colleague, Commander Michelle Noonan and I chatting. And it's, it's literally going around to, to each, folks, each of the folks and checking in with them. How are you doing? How are you taking care of yourself? You know, a big piece of the work that we end up doing is boundary setting. Um, encouraging people to go home and have dinner with their families if that's something that is really important to them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our, our people work so hard. I mean, I could, I could get emotional thinking about just how hard our people are working on behalf of all of you and all of us. Uh, and sometimes they need a reminder to um, take a break, to take care of yourselves, um, and we are certainly in it for the long haul. And so it's about taking care of each other, reminding people of that. 
there's all, you know, I sent out a message to the entire, actually all three responses on Friday and called it a resilience message. And I wrote it from my heart and it was really around, you know, hey, we are on the front lines and it's okay to be stressed, to mm-hmm. feel stressed, that is normal. So a lot of normalization uh, while also trying to instill um, some amount of hope because hope has sort of gone by the wayside, I feel like in the past few years. Mm-hmm. We about it all the time now we don't as much sadly Mm -hmm. and i think that's really an important piece that hopefully we can shift towards um this is kind of off topic but living in midtown atlanta each night at eight o'clock p.m people open up their their doors and their windows Mm -hmm. and we clap and we cheer for all our healthcare workers and um, scientists and frontline workers um, and some people, you know, sing evidently tonight, we're going to be singing, we are the champions, yeah. we're going to change it to, they are the champions. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it provides that sense of hope that I think we've all been, um, missing lately. And that's what, um, me and, and my team, we try to instill into our responses and our work. Well, it's great to hear that this is sort of built into the structure and, Certainly watching TV these days and seeing nurses and doctors uh, um, sort of at the front lines and and what it's been like for them, but not really knowing what's going on behind the scenes and what kind of support they're getting and what that looks like and and how it's complicated now with the social distancing. Um, And to what extent have you had to adjust the work that you do on account of, well, I just, well, I guess you're used to this, right? You've worked uh, on other disease outbreaks, uh, outbreaks, um, Ebola most notably, um, in the recent past and so on. So how do you sort of get people or uh, keep people connected, right? And, and, and to attend to their own needs, um, you know, at a time when everybody is sort of kind of like literally running for the hills. Right. Um, and they very much are. I, I can tell you, anyone watching that whenever uh, retired Rear Admiral Dr. Ann Shuket or Dr. Nancy Messonnier, mm-hmm. Dr. Uh, Dan Jernigan, any of, any of those folks from CDC are speaking, listen to them. They, their hearts are in this, their souls are in this, and luckily for all of us, their, their minds are in this. Um, and they will be straight shooters uh, in terms of um, things to follow, instructions to follow. And I would say that cdc.gov is an outstanding resource. And so I'd, I'd encourage folks to um, get their information from, from cdc.gov, not, and just don't worry about all the noise. Um, <clears throat> said and done. I mean, I love Anderson Cooper. I don't miss him at eight o'clock at night. So I, I watch it too. Um, but I also have the benefit of knowing um, um, the folks on, on our side who are working nonstop on this. And so um, I think it's about informing ourselves with facts um, and, and that's where cdc.gov comes in. Um, and there's a lot of guidance on there. And I, I'm sure a lot of folks um, who might be attending this are concerned about certain population groups that we as social workers are always concerned about especially at times like this, uh, our homeless population, um, our um, more fragile um, populations, and there are specific guidelines for working with those groups. Um, and so I think, I think it's about um, recognizing that this is temporary, even though it feels very life altering. But if mm-hmm. folks had been listening since early, early on, uh, Dr. Messonnier, in fact, said, you know, there will be disruptions to our daily lives. Like, mm-hmm. so when the scientists are speaking to listen and to read, um, and not that the media hasn't done um, a, a great job in getting stuff out there, but just um, it, can, it can be a, a lot, and it mm-hmm. can be a lot, and, and it can increase uh, stress for all of us. Um, so just, it's important to read, um, read the facts and listen to the scientists. And that's how I um, tend to get through this is, is focusing on that and knowing 
full well how hard people are working to combat this virus. Well, yeah, no, all across the world, the finest minds, right, are engaged now in, in trying to understand exactly what's going on and how best to tackle uh, this disease outbreak. And I understand, I imagine that you've, based on your own experience in this field, um, have can, can sort of judge, I mean, um, you know, what might work, what would be helpful, and, and certainly the CDC is, is at the leading edge of making those recommendations and providing us guidelines. But I, you know, just to be- well, Richard, yeah. I'm sorry, I don't mean that, but if you could see, I'm teleworking. <laughs> okay. um, I see you in your living room. Um, and that's, I know some folks are, are frontline workers mm. and they need to interact with their clients, but um, anyone, you know, if we can work on this response virtually, which many of us are, mm -hmm. Than, than most people can. And again, I, I get that frontline um, clinicians have a harder time, you know, with certain population groups. Right. Um, it is really to heed, heed the warnings. This is how we will, um, sorry to use the term, but flatten the curve um, and, and reduce our numbers. Yeah, yeah, and, and can't forget that um, social services, I think, are deemed essential services, right, for people in need. So, so we do have social workers who are um, out there um, doing this work um, they in are, person, face-to-face, -face. yeah. I commend each and every one of you, but I also implore, implore each and every one of you to truly practice social distancing. I know it's easier said mm -hmm. than done, but it is so important that you stay healthy mm -hmm. and model the behavior that we want to see from others. Um, and so it, it's just an important thing to consider in, in your work. Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing, I'm hearing the, you know, the concern and, and, and frankly, the emotion in your voice. And I'm just wondering personally, do you, I mean, is there something about this? I mean, that's just, I mean, different that, 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 that is just, um, you know, um, troubling for you in, in terms of um, what's going to happen and, and how we're going to deal with it? Well, um, I don't mean, I hope I don't sound morbid or anything. Mm. I, it, it's, it's the realism of the world we're in right now. Um, I think what's been challenging for a lot of folks here, um, and I know we have some international folks on the, on the call as well, but for those of us here in the States, you know, this is on our shores. This is here now. And I was talking with response leadership and, you know, our folks are really tired, but there's been a shift and that's because it's actually here with Ebola, even though, you know, myself and a and, and number of other officers and hundreds of other officers and CDC employees alike were in Liberia or Sierra Leone or Guinea, um, working on those front lines, we were over there. We knew our families were generally safe back home. Mm -hmm. And they could worry about us, but we, um, and there I am at the Monrovia uh, Medical Unit, our Ebola treatment unit with um, um, then uh, Secretary of the UN, Ban Ki-moon. And so our families could worry about us, but we were working, we were busy, you know, we didn't have time to worry. Well, now we're working on this response from our homes and it does affect our daily lives. And so we're putting in all the hours and working double time as we do a response, but then there's no debriefing <laughs> and going out to dinner with friends afterwards, having a couple yeah. of, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's been removed. So it's, that's why I mentioned the Midtown yell here in Atlanta and other mm -hmm. things. Um, that we need to do to support each other because this is it's it is a challenging time. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, let me I want to be mindful of the time. I should uh, check in with regard to questions from the audience. So, if that's okay, Jennifer, let me go and Please. see. Yeah. Um, the first question is pretty long. I I believe this coronavirus is going to change the way social work and human service workers do their jobs. I believe more of the jobs are going to go virtual or remote social worker and human service workers are going to check on their clients using Zoom and online service. What do you think about this issue? Um, I think we need to be prepared for any scenario. And I think that is definitely a realistic one. And certainly um, it's important for us to develop that kind of work with 
our more rural uh, situ uh, uh, rural clients and and the like. And mm -hmm. um, although I will tell you, um, there's nothing like um, you know being able to have that that um, that person to person, um, human to human uh, transfer of work. But um, I think we do need to be prepared for that. Um, and I'm not sure, um, um, I don't, I'm not sure what, which DHS is being referred to in the, in the question, but I think, I think we all have to pay attention to that reality and be prepared to adjust accordingly. Clients hmm. uh, are first and foremost, and they need to remain as such. And so we need to get to them whatever ways we can, um, whatever mechanisms need to be put in place and needs to be a priority. Mm -hmm. um, second question, I was thinking about this myself. How do you take care of yourself when you've been working nonstop for weeks? Okay, first thing, do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> okay. At CDC, no, I say that as well. Um, I have a tremendous family whom I adore, and I feel adored by them, and we are constantly in touch, and um, my sisters and I share memes. Uh, as well as some of my friends. And I tell you, memes are a great way to get through. Um, I have supportive leadership when some days it's, I'm just like, you know, I just, I got to sleep in this day, but I'll be on, you know, at nine or 10 or whatever. Um, but it's about having that open communication with, with leadership, um, with your leadership and letting them know if, if you're hitting sort of a, a um, you know, one of your boundaries. Um, mm. Unfortunately, my boundaries are pretty extended. I love this work. I thrive in this work. I believe in this. My heart and soul is fully in it. Mm -hmm. so folks close to me know they have to pull me back a little bit. <laughs> okay, well, and maybe this is a related follow-up question, but so how do you stay positive and maintain hope? <clears throat> Keep your own cup full um, to the point where you feel you can adequately support others' mental health. So, so what is it? I, I more strength-based. I mean, positive psychology. I mean, what, what is it that, that you're doing for yourself? Well, very strength-based. Um, I, I think, like I was saying, um, this is what I was put on this earth to do. Um, mm -hmm. I believe each one of us have, um, you know, our own missions, our own, um, our own goals in life. And I have developed over the years, you know, since my time at Columbia, which was 20 years ago, shaft year of 2000, um, that living a life of service, um, while it can be very challenging and we do need to find time for ourselves, um, this is what makes me tick. This mm. is what inspires me. And I take those little, little nuggets of inspiration, um, you know, when you know, a colleague says, you know, that, that email was very impactful. Um, I can't thank you enough. You put words right in my mouth, you know, mm -hmm. you took the words right out of my mouth or, um, you know, before it came to our shores when there was, Hey Jen, can I just have a hug? Um, and you know, when people open themselves up, um, to me and to our work, um, I feel validated in what I do and that's, that keeps me going. Yep, it's gratitude and, and, and this sense of, 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 you know, feeling, you know, that, that, that we're honored and privileged uh, to share people's every, experiences, right? Every day, Richard, and I, I say that to every, um, every social worker I come across um, and others who ask about our profession, it is such, such an honor and privilege to do what we do to be that trusted source for so many people. Um, I can't be prouder to be a social worker. I have it in my signature line, you know, a lot of MDs and PhDs here at CDC, but um, I proudly have my LCSW-C and I actively share that with folks um, frequently that this is what our profession can do in non-traditional settings, in traditional settings, we, we matter and we help others uh, re remember that they matter too. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I've got a question here about social distancing. So the term is a bit repulsive to me as a social yeah. worker because yeah. of how it is defined and used at this time. I'll reframe it to more accurately be 
described as physical distancing. For me, social distancing triggers or feeds into mental health issues brought on by the fear, anxiety, depression. At this, what, what are your thoughts about just, you know, how we're all using this term social distancing so freely now? I'm really glad you brought that up because one of my mentors, um, uh, Dr. Brian Flynn and um, my former colleagues at the Center for the Study of Traumatic Stress, they actually have been talking about this, that mm. we really, it'd be nice to get away from the term social distancing um, while, you know, it's sort of taken a life of its own right now. Um, and, it, and it is important from a public health perspective. We absolutely agree that, that the, it's more about physical distancing mm. with social connectedness. Mm -hmm. And I think that's harder for folks to, um, it's more of a mouthful right now with the way right. it's being shared. Um, but that's certainly an important piece and I'm really glad you brought it up. And it's something that I have raised up on, on our side is mm -hmm. as we can encourage the physical distancing with the social connectedness. Connectedness is a word that I use frequently. Um, I, you, you could tell I come from the suicide prevention world and I think um, connectedness is, is the number one protective factor. That's mm -hmm. general opinion. Um, and uh, I, I think we need to focus on connectedness as much as possible um, to support each other, especially those with pre-existing uh, conditions such as anxiety or depression that mm -hmm. are not alone in this and whatever we can do to bolster them and support them, um, even if it's throwing open their window at eight o'clock at night and hearing everyone cheer that we are truly all in this together. So yeah, just to, to draw upon your experience, right, um, with regard to trauma and uh, suicide and so on, and, and I think this came up recently that uh, one of the fears of keeping things shut, our country closed, is that this is going to push up uh, or uh, create or precipitate uh, suicides and so on down the line. What, what are your thoughts about that? Um, well, of course, I. I hope not, um, you know, from my heart. Um, but I do, I do have concerns uh, around uh, mental health. Again, our more vulnerable populations are at a higher risk um, because of the general state. And so um, I think it is about encouraging that, that connectedness. So if you're able to um, provide clinical care remotely, um, please do it. Um, whatever the rules are, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things we're talking about human being lives and that always needs the first important needs to be at the, at the front. Um, and, um, check in on folks, um, those friends, family that, you know, um, maybe might be experiencing a harder time than most, uh, and not to burden all of you who are already social workers and already doing all the frontline work. Um, but, you know, encouraging group chats or the like, I think we need to do whatever we can to stay connected. All right. Well, you know, in this moment of uncertainty, I, I, I don't know. I mean, this is the question and I'm not sure how I would answer it either. How do you see our society um, being changed by this pandemic economically, uh, socially? Do you think certain populations will continue to be stigmatized even, even more so? Um, or, or is this one of those moments where we do have an opportunity maybe to transcend those kinds of differences and come together? Well, I think we have an opportunity every day to do that. And um, what I'm hoping is that our that, that folks can really truly recognize that this world isn't about them. It's not about each and every one of us. It's about all of us. And that, you know, we are only as good as our sickest or weakest or um, most vulnerable person. And that we need to live our lives um, in a way that is kind, um, it's more gentle, it's more thoughtful with each other. And I know I may seem, you know, rose colored glasses, but that's what I'm hoping can come out of this. That truly, if you stay inside, you will save lives. I know that sounds odd to people, but it is very true. Um, 
and that we have a responsibility as a human being um, in this world to take care of each other and um, to really focus on um, on on that, on yeah, no, it's, it, it's, it's such a contradiction, right? We have to stay inside, but we have to keep our perspective outside, right? Mm -hmm. And to think about, mm -hmm. and again, it's not just outside our home or our community, but literally globally. I mean, this is, this is mm -hmm. something that involves um, the entire world. And it's, I, I think, um, difficult um, for us to think only in terms of our country or our city. Or I mean, we, we, oh, yeah. We're all in this together. So we're, as, we, as, tr as we truly are. And we need, uh, to, we need to support each other. I FaceTime with friends in Thailand and Saudi Arabia and all over the world. And I encourage you to do that. Um, at, you know, if you have friends internationally or just around the corner um, to actually look at each other. Um, no matter what kind of bedhead you might have or whatever, um, my dog likes to bark when I'm on the phone. Um, so these are, these are important things we need to be doing to support each other. Okay. And finally, I have one question here. Uh, Jen, you spoke about people we should listen to who have their heart in the right place. Um, how do you achieve what you want given organizational constraints or red tape that, that maybe we encounter in, you know, our organizations and in our daily, daily lives? Patience. patience. A lot of patience. patience. Um, but in all seriousness, um, I have seen, again, I'm representing Jen, but I'm still being polite. Um, um, the public health officials, they're not gonna lie to you. Okay. They're not gonna lie to you. Um, it's too important. Um, they're gonna be honest and upfront, um, or at least the ones, um, the ones I know and have the privilege of working for. Okay. Well, and all right. I have to still one last question um, uh, regarding your work. What did, what does your typical day look like? Oh, geez. When, when do you have to get on that Peloton and, and, <laughs> and ride? I know I need to do it more. It's been a, it's been a rough period, but um, <clears throat> uh, my typical work day. Well, of course there is no typical work day, but um, uh, we, especially during response, I guess I'll, I'll give you that perspective. We have morning huddles where we check in either uh, my um, division or uh, my team that I'm part of with the response, which is a larger group. Um, and we check in, see what the breaking news is. I mean, as you guys know, things change literally minute by minute. Mm. You will hear different guidance documents coming out. Um, you'll see them on cdc.gov. It is literally minute to minute. I mean, Last week, my plan for the team had to completely shift with all of the teleworking and we didn't, I mean, it's just been constant. So there's a lot of change. Um, I try to spend as much as, my, much as I can um, interacting with colleagues, providing briefings, debriefings, um, sharing information and also receiving information and truly listening to people's stories. A lot of these deployments can be very, very challenging and certainly even um, working in the emergency operations center where it is, it is a 24 seven operation. Um, so it's about um, carving out time to give people an opportunity to feel heard um, and to provide that support. A lot of emails, a lot of emails. Um, and you know, we also, we help prepare our deployers before they go out the door. We're part of their medical clearance process. I mean, it, it runs the gamut, um, it, but it is, it's a lot of work, but it, again, as you said earlier, Richard, it is such a true privilege to be able to do what I do and to serve um, the people of um, the CDC and, um, and our country. Well, thank you, Jennifer, for the work that you do. And of course, for being our guest today on Social Impact Live. So thank you once again. Thank you so much.
Um, I think that concludes our show for today. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, next week, we have uh, Dr. Mashura Akalova, um, who will be here to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on refugees, um, her area of expertise. So look forward to seeing um, all of you then next Tuesday. Um, thanks for joining this special edition of Social Impact Live. Take care. Be well. Bye-bye now. <laughs>